<clears throat> I also um, uh, did a little bit of research at the National Cancer Institute. And then I've got experience at the Food and Drug Administration, the US Department of Agriculture when I was a co-op student at Virginia Tech. And I've worked with a number of the different agencies uh, who participate in SBIR, DOD, NSF, et cetera. Um, I also have worked in nonprofit and for-profit environments, the most recent of which was at the Jackson Laboratory, um, but also a small biotech company in uh, Texas and a uh, Florida-based consulting company. And then my science background is in microbiology and immunology and cancer genetics. So um, that's, that's my quick snippet on my CV. Okay, Let's see if we can. there we go. So today's objectives are really to uh, understand the NIH peer review process. I know that it can appear as a big black box to many people. And so I wanna help kind of unpack that. At a very high level, um, the peer review process goes like this. So company submits uh, a really innovative idea to NIH. It actually goes to the Center for Scientific Review who um, assigns that to an NIH institute or center and study section. So two different things that happen there. Um, then the study section reviews your application for its scientific and technical merit. The Institute evaluates all of that feedback uh, and relevance for their research priorities. Then it goes through a requisite um, second level of review called an advisory council or board review who makes the recommendation for funding. Um, and then uh, those recommendations go to the Institute director who approves funding plans and takes final action. So let's break that down a bit more. Um, so the scientific review, group, this is really uh, the first level of review and the most important piece for your purposes where um, uh, these reviewers who come from both academia and industry are providing an independent external review. Also important to note, they don't make funding decisions. They're making recommendations to the Institute staff on the scientific and technical merit, on your appropriateness of your budget and how long your project will take. Uh, they look at things like human subjects protections and uh, vertebrate animals, biohazards, your resource sharing plans, and other administrative factors. So it's a, it's a huge hurdle to get over. The output of that is an impact score, and you get uh, a debrief, basically a summary statement that gives you all the strengths and weaknesses of what you spent hopefully months propose, uh, preparing. And so this first level of review happens about three months after you submit your grant application. Then three to six months later, um, usually about three months, the advisory council meets. And this advisory council is uh, a group of people that the Institute selects. And they're basically uh, concurring with the first level of review and they're assessing the quality of that process. If something went awry, um, if there was a conflict of interest or some, some terrible thing that you believe you have reason to bring up to that council, this is the time to do it. I will say that is a very, very rare occurrence. Um, and when that happens, if you do an appeal, you cannot, you cannot reapply to NIH until that appeal has been um, uh, discussed and some decision rendered. And also the peer review process works really well. So again, it's a rare occurrence that there would even be um, an appeal. Um, the advisory council also advises on new funding opportunities. The program staff bring concepts to them. They discuss them. They say, we want to put out a request for applications or a program announcement on this area. And, and then maybe a month or two later, you will see that um, in the NIH guide as a new funding opportunity announcement. 
the broad omnibus solicitation, those aren't types of things that go to council, but these are very specific um, um, high priority areas. The council also evaluates program priorities and relevance. They offer uh, um, recommendations to institute staff and advise the institute director on policy. And so the output of this step is a funding recommendation that your program director will then take under consideration. <clears throat> then about um, one to three months later, the institute director is looking at the funding plan that the program staff and council have, um, have put forward. And it's ultimately the institute director's uh, stamp of approval on these funding decisions. But that said, there's rarely a time where the Institute Director will not concur with the program officer's recommendation. So what they do is they'll go in a meeting, into a meeting after council, and they'll put together a funding plan within that Institute of all of the different applications that they want to fund. Um, so it's a, it's a very important step once that advisory council meets. So scientific review group assignments, these are really important um, because these are the people who are looking at your specific proposal. Uh, usually there's about three qualified reviewers who are assigned to your application. And those assignments are based on a number of things, um, the science that you're proposing, obviously the reviewer's expertise, um, suggestions from you on the types of expertise. Now you, you can use this form that I mentioned in one of the earlier webinars called the PHS assignment request form. You can't name names, but you can say, I need somebody who's an expert in thoracic surgery, or I need somebody who's expert in the regulatory process and medical devices, whatever it is, you have a number of uh, different ways to highlight areas of expertise. Sometimes the scientific review officer will come to the program director for suggestions on reviewers. Um, they'll get suggestions from the scientific review group members themselves. Uh, the um, assignment process also takes into consideration conflicts of interest. Now on your, on your PHS assignment request form, you can actually say names of people who you do not want to review your application, understanding that this is a peer review. And so you can't name all of your peers, you're going to conflict everybody, but sometimes there's bad blood or for any number of reasons, there's a appropriate time to say, Dr. X or Y should not serve on my study section. And finally, the scientific review officer takes into consideration workload. They're not going to give one reviewer, you know, 32 applications to review. So a lot goes into this assignment. Um, also know that these assignments are confidential. And so while you'll get a summary statement and critiques, you'll never know specific, and, and you'll get the roster you will never know specifically who those three reviewers were who reviewed your application. Okay, so then you get into the actual review and the evaluation of your grant application. And so these reviewers are looking at overall impact, the scored review criteria, any additional criteria that were highlighted in the uh, request for application or program announcement and any other additional review considerations. And I'll go through those. But importantly, um, you should know that the scientific review group or SRG rosters are posted about a month prior to the meeting. And I've given you the hyperlinks here so that you can take a look at those um, and, and both look at the rosters and you know, how to get those, but also the various study sections because you can identify study sections on that PHS assignment request form that you feel are appropriate or is appropriate to review. Usually it's just one, but you might mention one or two. 
Okay, so I talked about the overall impact. This is your this is your score that you will see on your summary statement. And this essentially is the, the likelihood of your project to have a sustained powerful influence on the research field involved. And it's based on five scored criteria, significance, innovation, approach, investigators slash team, and the environment. And again, any additional review criteria that were explicitly noted in the funding opportunity. Now, you can go to these review criteria um, guidelines through this hyperlink that I've provided. It's a really, really good link. Um, so I'm unboxing it here because uh, if we have time, I can go back to this, but, um, but it's, it's worth you kind of perusing and getting familiar with, with what those criteria are because these are what the reviewers are given and it's a fairly it's a very level playing field where you can see exactly what they're being told to score you on. Now I know we talked a lot like last week on the specific aims page. Um, I'm going to spend just a minute on the research strategy section which really is the critical major part of your research plan other than the aims. Um, it's the nuts and bolts of your application and it's divided into these three sections, significance, innovation, and approach. Now remember, I just said that the five criteria are significance, innovation, approach, investigators, and environment. Hence my, my reason for spending a minute here. So on significance, the reviewers are asked, and you have this in your funding opportunity. So again, a level playing field. Does the project address an important problem or critical barrier to progress in the field? If the aims of the project are achieved, how will scientific knowledge or technical capability and or clinical practice be improved? And how will completion of the aims change those concepts or methods technologies, et cetera, that are driving the field. So as you're writing your significance section, you know, you want to give enough details that um, provide answers to those questions. And don't skimp. Obviously, you've got a certain number of pages um, on that research plan. So it's a balance here. But know that the farther removed that your reviewers are from the field, the more information you're going to need to provide on the basic biology, the importance of the area, et cetera. Um, describe your significance in the context of the state of your field, your long-term research plans, and any preliminary data that you may have. You're not going to put it there, but you'll refer them to another section. You want to make a case for the importance of the research to improving human health. I mean, that's ultimately the, the mission of NIH. And you want to explicitly make that scientific premise clear. So I like to give you these little checkpoints. And when you get the slides, you can print these and just have them side by side as you're preparing your proposal. Um, and you should be able to check these off. I describe the importance of my technology to the field, even if my reviewers are not specifically in that field. Um, you point out the project's significance throughout the application. So you wanna weave a theme. Um, the application shows that I'm aware of opportunities, all the gaps, any hurdles that you have to overcome to advance the state of the science. And you state how your research results or technology, product, et cetera, will advance the field. You wanna show them how you're gonna fill that gap and take, you're able to check off that you've scanned that review committee roster from prior cycles. And the importance of doing this is you can cite the reviewer's work. They love to be applauded you know, for their work in the middle of review. So the significance section is a really good place to do this. So then we get to innovation, okay? Um, does, the, does the application challenge and seek to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms? For example, are you proposing a novel approach or methodology? Is it a new instrument? 
Um, are those approaches or methods or instruments, et cetera, new to one field or novel in a broad sense? Or is it a refinement or improvement or of an um, existing approach or methodology? So innovation for NIH doesn't have to always be something brand spanking new. It can be an improvement upon um, an existing technology or approach. You just have to make it clear when you're writing your application that that is indeed where the innovation lies. So in the innovation section, you want to explicitly describe how your proposed research is new or unique. Um, for example, you're exploring new technologies that's going to result in a new product, it's going to create new knowledge. I always think it's important to include some sort of a competitive landscape chart. This is just an example, kind of a template I give you. Um, <clears throat> you, you will have competitors. If you say in your application, I have no competitors in this field, the reviewers are going to be really raising eyebrows. So know the field, know the research and, and other products that maybe are even close to what you're doing, and then differentiate your product from those competitors. Reviewers also like charts because, you know, a, a picture speaks a thousand words. And so um, this kind of helps remind them about where your product is, is showing better advancements or improvements over existing ones. So then you've got your checkpoint slide. Again, you should be able to check these off as you read your innovation section that you've shown how the research is new and unique. You explain how that project can refine or improve or propose a new application. And you are, have explained how that project can create a paradigm shift or, or um, you know, that you've got data to support an innovative approach. If you can't make these check marks, then go back and reread and rewrite those sections. <clears throat> so then there's the approach section. So this is now the third review criterion, right? And this is where reviewers are really going to come in hard on, on scrutinizing your, um, uh, your proposal. So they're asked, are the overall strategy, methodology, and analyses well-reasoned and appropriate to carry out the aims? Are potential problems and alternative strategies and benchmarks for success presented? Um, if this is project is like a phase one, it's in the early stages of development, will the strategy establish feasibility? And will risky aspects of that project be managed? And how will they be managed? If it's a project that's involving clinical research, then they're going to look very closely at um, your plans for protecting human subjects from research risk, inclusion of minorities, both sexes slash genders, the inclusion of children, women, um, minorities, et cetera, and to make sure that those are justified in terms of the scientific goals and the research strategy that you've proposed. So when you're writing this section, you know, you, you really, I didn't talk last week about creating bullets. You want to outline this section, organize it in a way that's written to those review criteria. And so those are all going to be, remember, this is a roadmap from your specific aims. It's all going to be around your aims that you've um, um, proposed. You want to detail a few sets of experiments to address each aim, show them any preliminary data that you have. And if you don't have prelimin prelimin pre preliminary data, then cite data from literature that's going to give them a good comfort zone that you're likely to establish feasibility. Again, they're going to scrutinize your approach and they're going to look to see um, not only what you plan to do, but how you plan to do it. DOD is a little more forgiving on you being descriptive in your research. You know, this is what we're going to do. NIH, yep, that's important, but they want to know the devil in the details of the how. Cite a publication that shows you have expertise 
or have a team with expertise to carry out these methods. Um, you know, if you don't have a proven record using that method, you really need to state clearly why you think you, you will succeed. Scientific rigor is an um, important aspect of the NIH peer review process. And so the reviewers want to see that you've included sample numbers, um, you know, study power, that you've got some plan for doing a statistical analysis of your data. And if you don't have the expertise to do those study powers and, and do the uh, statistical uh, analysis, then you need to bring somebody onto the team, like a statistician who has that expertise. But they'll often ask, how did they, how did they come up with this number of uh, individuals to include in their study, or if it's involving animals first. How did you come up with those animal numbers? That's the study power that they're looking at. So they want to see that there's real strong scientific rigor in your experimental design. Um, <clears throat> in the approach, this may be a repeat from last week, but for those who, who did not attend, you know, bold type your specific aims and under each aim, describe what those experiments will be um, and any potential pitfalls and alternative strategies. Uh, and then in your approach section, include a project timeline, something like this, um, that shows, you know, maybe over one or two or three years, um, uh, what your aims are. And you can see here in this example, one aim is not dependent upon the other. So aim two is starting while aim one is going on. And aim three, which is assay validation, starts more into the third quarter of year one. So they like to see that sort of staggered approach so that they don't feel like the success of one aim is really going to be dependent upon the other. And we talked about that last week. So you can see this is a much more uh, detailed checkpoint slide where, again, I want you to be able to check off. I've given enough background and preliminary data or literature citations if you don't have preliminary data to really ground the reviewers and give them some context. Each of your specific aims will result in a set of experiments, and each of those experiments um, uh, covers what could go wrong. This is the potential pitfalls in an alternative strategy section. Um, your experiments can yield meaningful data to support your rationale. You've provided enough detail rather than being overly descriptive to convince the reviewers that you understand the methods needed. Um, you explicitly state your team's resources and expertise. You describe the results that you are anticipating. So this might say expected outcomes in that approach section. And then you go through and maybe have others on your team go through and get rid of information that's not needed. It's so easy in the significant section to write, to write like a mini review. That's not what they're looking for. And you're going to need that space to really cover the approach section. You keep track of and explain who's doing what, what they're doing, when and where, how long, and how much it's going to cost. And that timeline shows when you expect to complete your aims. So those are the three major criteria that link to the um, uh, research plan. Then the fourth review criterion is investigators. So the reviewers are asked, are the program director, principal investigators, collaborators, and other researchers well suited to the project? Do those investigators have the appropriate expertise and training? Um, do the investigators demonstrate an ongoing record? So is there some, is there some history to their collaboration? And if there's not, that's fine. But then you need to, to really kind of highlight 
uh, the importance of the team and what your communication plans will be and things like that. Um, and if it's a multiple PI project, so remember at NIH, you can have two principal investigators or three even, um, the reviewers will be, uh, be asked, do they have complementary and integrated expertise? And is the leadership approach, governance plan, and organizational structure appropriate? So just by these questions, if it's a multi-PI project, you'd think, hmm, maybe I'll include a little graphic that shows who's doing what on that team and what the governance structure will be. So on the investigator criterion, the bio sketch is where the reviewers are also going to look very critically. Um, and so, you know, the bio sketch has to be written very carefully for that particular project. That bio sketch is going to provide the reviewers with a summary of your key personnel's academic and professional background, any achievements, any scientific accomplishments, patents, et cetera. So always tailor it. I can't tell you how often I've seen kind of a, a boilerplate per, um, bio sketch. And, and that's not good because it does tie to this one review criterion. So you always wanna tailor it to whatever application you're writing. If you put in multiple SBIRs, make sure that personal statement is is a little bit different for each. And then the fifth criterion is environment. So will, again, the reviewers are asked these questions and you're provided these questions in the funding opportunity. Will the scientific environment in which the work will be done contribute to the probability of success? Are equipment and other physical resources available to the investigators adequate? And will the project benefit from any unique features? You know, do you have a unique collaborative arrangement? Do you have access to some unique um, equipment at a university? You want to describe that, okay? And in this case, the facilities and resources and equipment attachments are going to be key for them to answer these questions. All right, so in the facilities and other resources document, you're describing what's available to you. This is not just, you know, I have an office that's, you know, 400 square feet or whatever it is. Um, work with your company leadership to identify any unique resources and any external resources that you can leverage. It's very common that a small company, a startup is not going to have all of the resources, uh, facilities and equipment but maybe they're leasing space at, at another facility or a university. So, you know, you want, to, you want to describe what you're going to be doing and also what your collaborators are offering to help ensure the success of your project. You wanna convey how the scientific environment in which you're going to carry out the work contributes to the probability of your success. And I usually like in the, in the facilities section to start out a paragraph that says scientific environment. Um, there's no page limit to this section. You don't want it to be 38 pages, but you do want to give enough details um, so that the reviewers can assess you based on that prior slide. The same with the equipment attachment. Um, give a list of your major items of equipment that you already have access to. If you need expensive equipment, especially during phase one, you want to consider leasing it. Um, and if you need to purchase some equipment, then make sure that in your budget justification, you've clearly uh, detailed that um, uh, reason for why that piece of equipment is essential for your project. All right, so the reviewers are going to look at equipment as part of that environment review criterion. And then, as I mentioned, there might be additional review criteria. Now, these won't be scored, um, but they will look at any funding opportunity specific criteria. 
Um, maybe they said in the application, in the funding opportunity, you need to have uh, an advisory board as part of your um, project. So, you know, it, it could be any number of things. These items are considered in the overall impact score, but they're not scored individually. So human subjects protection, inclusion of women, minorities, and children, vertebrate animals. If it's a resubmission, they're asked to assess, you know, did you respond to um, prior review criticisms because they have that summary statement. Uh, if it's a supplement, which NIH calls a revision, you might have very specific um, review criteria that you're responding to. And if there are bi biohazards, you want to explain how you're managing those. So, so much goes into this whole impact score um, that, that ultimately you will see. Some common application problems. Now let's walk through the, the various criteria with significance. The scientific premise is weak or not even explicitly noted. Uh, it's not significant. It's not exciting research. You know, remember, as you're writing this AIMS page or the approach section, you're trying to keep them in a page turning mode. Um, the, the rationale is not compelling, or maybe it's just incremental science and, and low impact. With innovation, um, it's just often not clearly laid out for them. It's, you know, you may be given short shrift with uh, a couple, two or three sentences. You want to really write that innovation section um, with enough detail that you're convincing them what is novel, what is, what is going to happen that's going to move the scientific field. Um, problems with the aims, one being dependent upon another, it just being too much work for the, the period of time that you're proposing, um, that the aims are just too unfocused or the goals are unclear. They, they get to the end of that aims section and they're still scratching their head wondering, I'm still not clear what they're planning to do. Um, you're not going to score well on this. Maybe it's um, just uncertain what any future directions might hold, especially if this is a feasibility study and you're looking toward a phase two or a phase two B. Um, experimental approach, you've given maybe too much unnecessary detail. So they get you know, lost in the forest for the trees. There's not enough detail on the approach. So that's where you might see a comment that it's overly descriptive and we don't have enough detail to know um, if, how they're going to carry out this uh, uh, aim or aims. There's not enough preliminary data or literature research if you don't have data to show that you're likely to establish feasibility. I'll make a comment also about preliminary data. I mean, if you've got it and it's really good convincing data, then include it. If the data themselves are going to raise questions, you're gonna be better off having left it off of your proposal. Um, other issues with the approach, little or no expertise with the methods or the, the, that you're planning to carry out, a lack of controls, um, cor correlative or descriptive data. Remember, unlike DOD, they want to see the how. Uh, leaving out the potential pitfalls and alternative strategies section or um, not even discussing how you plan to interpret the data and what the expected outcomes are. Um, common problems with the investigator or team. There's uh, no demonstration of expertise or publications in the approach. Um, maybe it's low pro productivity or not many papers. Or maybe if you have a paper, it's from 42 years ago, that's not really going to help you on an investigator um, um, criterion. Uh, no collaborators recruited to help balance out the team, or maybe no letters from your collaborators. You may have collaborators, and I've seen this, 
but you omitted their letters or just chosen to not get them. Um, the team has not worked together in the past. This isn't an automatic failure, but I have seen on summary statements where reviewers say exactly this. I mean, these bullets are actually coming from summary statements. So if you haven't worked together, as I said, um, explain that and say, but here's how we're going to um, make sure that the team, you know, is in strong communication. We're going to meet weekly. They're going to attend our, our lab meetings, et cetera. Um, problems with the environments, your facilities and other resources document is just too simplified and not well described in terms of what, you know, your scientific environment and, and um, what's available to you. And then with the equipment upload, uh, that, the no, that the necessary equipment is not available, therefore you can't carry out the research or they feel like you cannot. A lot of times it's not that these things are not available, they're just not available to the reviewer as they're taking the time to review you know, all of these different sections. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the scoring system. Um, NIH uses a nine point scale from one to nine. It's like golf, not bowling, so lower is always better. Um, if you get a score of, everything ends up being multiplied by 10. So if you get a score of a 10, uh, that is a perfect scored application. If you get a score of a 42, you're kind of veering more toward the poorer score and there were some, some issues found. And we'll go through some of this. Um, the preliminary scores are actually provided by the reviewers prior to the review meeting. They get put into a secure uh, database and those are made available to all of the other review group members. The overall impact score, so let's say a, a 21 or a, you know, a 30, that's voted on by all of the eligible uh, voting reviewers, those who don't have a conflict of interest. And that's done by private ballot at the meeting. So my next door neighbor reviewer or on Zoom is not going to know what score I'm giving. Um, so it's, it's kept very confidential. Um, the scored review criteria are only given by those three assigned reviewers as part of their critiques or summary statement. And those are generally not discussed one by one at the review. So they're talking more about, about the overall impact score and then the strengths and weaknesses that drove them to that score. So the impact score, if you, you really want to get ones and twos, maybe a three here and there on your, um, on your various sections, okay? And because these are really exceptional or outstanding scores. If there's minor weaknesses, if there are moderate weaknesses, they're going to use those descriptors. And that's what's going to drive some of these scores more into the fours and fives and hopefully not sevens, eights, and nines, but it does happen. So again, I've given you a hyperlink here to guidelines on peer review scoring system and the procedure that the reviewers are given. Go ahead and take a look at these so that you're well-versed um, in these. NIH also uses what's called a triage process. This is called streamlining where um, they are asked to unscore about 50% of the um, applications. And this really allows the majority of the time to talk about the most meritorious applications. So those unscored or non-competitive applications aren't discussed at the review meeting, but they are scored. And so, uh, not scored, but they are um, uh, the details in your summary statement are provided to you. It's just that at the review meeting itself, there's not a 12 or 15 minute discussion of your application. So what does that mean? Well, in a scored application, at the beginning of your summary statement, you get what's called a resume and summary of the discussion. 
In an unscored application, that's the one piece you're missing. You'll only see the reviewer's strengths and weaknesses, comments, as well as the criterion scores. Um, so now your application has been reviewed, what happens? Well, check the ERA Commons. Uh, your impact score will be posted around three days after the review meeting occurs. Your summary statement isn't going to be released until four, four five, six weeks. I think eight weeks is, a, is a less likely now. They've gotten very good about releasing these in the four to six week period. It's a confidential document that goes only to the principal investigator, to the program official at NIH, and the advisory council members. Now, we want you communicating with your program officer, but wait until you actually have that summary statement before contacting them. I know a lot of people want to, to do it the three days after, um, but they won't have a whole lot to share with you. So understand your score. That impact score is going to range now. Remember I said it was on a scale of one to nine. They multiply that by 10, so it'll be from 10 to 99. Um, some scores will have a percentile that's rare for SBIR, but if you ever see that, it's the rel how you ranked relative to other applications in the study section over the past three meetings. Now, SBIR typically doesn't have a percentile for this reason. These are ad hoc review meetings. So there is no comparison to the prior three meetings as opposed to a standing study section that might be used um, for other types of grant mechanisms. So all you'll see is that raw impact score or hopefully not, but if it's unscore, it's going to be a double asterisk. And again, this just says you ranked in the lower 50% of that committee. It doesn't mean you know you had a fatal flaw or don't ever come back. Um, it's, it's all relative to how you rank within that particular study section. If you get a, um, a not recommended for further consideration, this is a serious um, outcome. It, I, I actually have not seen one in years. It's usually something is proposed that's very unethical. Um, there's you know, serious concerns that have been raised as it pertains to human subjects. And you will not be eligible for funding for that proposal. Okay, so rare occurrence, but know that these are the, the different outcomes of, of that scoring procedure. Now, in the case of an unfavorable outcome, it's kind of like steps of bereavement. You're going to be angry. Those idiot reviewers didn't understand what I was saying. They missed this on page X. You're going to go into some denial and isolation. You might go into a bargaining. You know, I'm going to call my program officer and try to try to establish a well. If I address this problem, will you fund me? And they'll probably say we need to have you re revise and resubmit. Um, you may go into a state of depression, and then finally uh, acceptance of that, of that outcome of review, and maybe that cycles back. But um, in all seriousness, after the review, after you get your summary statement, schedule a call with your program officer. This is not with your scientific review officer who was managing the review, but now that baton gets handed off to the program officer and ask things like, what's the likelihood that this project will be funded? Um, should I consider resubmitting? What's the timing for you program officer deciding on what will be funded? And maybe, maybe there were some concerns, but no major weaknesses. You could ask the program official, would it be helpful for me to prepare a one pager that summarizes the uh, major weaknesses and how we would address those? Um, so they're often, if you're on the cusp of a score of, a, of a, the pay line, 
then they might want something like that because they're going to go to bat for you at that at that funding plan meeting that I talked about earlier. This is not a full rewrite of your proposal, um, but maybe just a one or two pager that says these are the major areas, but here's here's where we um, could have better described this in our application. That likelihood of funding depends on many factors. If it's the beginning of the year, unfortunately, it becomes a weight game be because um, the institutes might not have their budgets yet. Um, if your application did just miss the pay line, the program officer might hold your application until later in the fiscal year. That doesn't mean you shouldn't revise and resubmit. Um, I think we talked about that. Um, but you can, you can be pulled back in, let's say in late August, where a program officer says, you know what, a couple of things fell off that we thought we were going to fund, and your application is now going um, to be next in line. Um, institutes might have what I call funding reserves for high programmatic priority areas. And so stay in touch with that program official check in every now and again and um, you know if you're still working on on the project give them some updates don't do the whole feasibility study because then they'll come back and say well there's really no no reason to fund your phase one and i have seen that happen but you maybe you have an update on some preliminary data that you um, could excite them with so stay in contact, don't be bubblegum on their shoe. And, and sometimes you do, you know, things happen, especially toward the, the end of the fiscal year. Now, if you are being considered for funding, um, chill the champagne or whatever your favorite uh, uh, beverage is, resolve any concerns noted on the summary statement and definitely uh, complete your just-in-time requirements, which you'll get through uh, ERA Commons. If you're not selected for an award, go back and assess those concerns that the reviewers raised. Um, there likely were some, some legitimate areas that they highlighted. Uh, discuss options with your team, with your colleagues, prepare to reapply and reconnect with the program official. So a few takeaways, um, stay informed, you know, this is just in terms of identifying appropriate funding opportunities, writing to those review criteria and understanding the mission of the Institute, of the whole NIH, their priorities, you know, take a look at their strategic plans, which they all post now. Um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work on the front end, but, but it, it does end up making for a better proposal when you can weave things like their priorities into your significant section, for example. Um, make a plan. You want to plan ahead. This is what I call the, the GPS or grants positioning strategy. Um, we sort of talked about that ideal timeline of uh, you know, eight, nine months in advance. Contact your program director early. Maybe share that specific aims page with them. Read the funding opportunity carefully, assessing the fit and following the instructions. And know your reviewer audience, okay? And as I said, you can take a look at prior um, study section rosters and get a sense of who's serving on, on the various review committees and plan for deadlines and resubmission options. Of course, um, I'm always happy to help. Karen, you know, is the, um, us on the TAP team, we're there. So there is uh, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And with that, I'll stop. And hopefully we have some, some comments or questions. Great, thank you, Joanne. Appreciate it, wow. That's a lot of information in a short period of time. Yeah, I think we only um, scheduled one hour today, so uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I save time. Yeah, definitely, so this is great. Um, do we have any questions from any of the uh, attendees? If so, uh, you can unmute or uh, un start your video and ask your questions directly. 
So while people might be typing in and um, having uh, some questions that uh, they might have, um, we did get, oh, I'm gonna have to open up a window, but we did get some questions as part of the review process or uh, as part of the registration process. Let me see if I can find a couple of them. Okay. And um, one of the things, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I said, I might go back no. to some of the URLs, but we can, um, yep. Oh, sure. You know, that's a great idea too. Um, I always find it interesting that um, um, companies don't know what to say when they're talking about the environment and the resources. People say, well, I'm a virtual company. I'm developing an, an app. So I don't really have any equipment and resources, but I find it interesting and would like to have you talk more about the scientific environment because it's not just, as you noted, about computers and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. No, and it's not always a brick and mortar building either. So your scientific environment is still going to be, you know, a description of, of um, you know, even if you're even if you're developing a new application that's going to be used on a mobile device, there is. You, um, I don't think you're just sitting at your kitchen table to do that. So. So there's a team involved. There is an overall scientific uh, environment where describe, you know, if it is your garage, that's, you don't wanna say it's your garage, but you give the square footage, but also say, we're a team that, um, I don't know, I'm kind of making this up off the cuff, but we're a team that, um, you know, we, we meet, we, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to go back to some examples of, of that particular yeah. example, but um, to me, the science environment is, do you have, do you have the wherewithal, whether it's in your garage or your basement or your renting space to succeed in the work you're carrying out? Maybe you have, um, various computers, maybe you've got to go into the cloud. I don't know because that's not my space, but you need to be able to describe what it is you're doing rather than just sitting there in front of a computer developing some app. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see, so um, one of the questions asked was, what is the difference between NSF, SBIR, 30%, and NIH in terms of allocation of funds to collaborating partners. So I think they're talking about the contractors, uh, you know, in-house, out-of-house work. Right. So, I mean, for SBIR, um, NIH has a little bit of flexibility, but normally they expect that the company will do two thirds of the work and can outsource about a third in phase one. In phase two, 50% of the work uh, is typically performed in-house at the company and 50% can be outsourced. NIH will deviate from this, especially if there's a clinical study going on. Um, you basically want to talk with your program director and make sure that their institute's going to approve those deviations but also in your, in your grant application, explain to the reviewers how much of this work is going to deviate and the why. They might put an administrative note up that the program staff should double check on this. But let's say um, in phase one, you need to outsource 40%. If it's well-documented and justified, it's it's uh, probably not going to create problems where I think NSF and some other agencies are pretty much by that um, mathematical formula and by the book. Great. NIH think, wants yeah. to see the best science funded. And sometimes that means flexing a little bit on these guidelines. And of course you would talk to your program officer before yeah. you submit your proposal. Definitely to do get that. their approval on that, right? 
-hmm. which I think could be, uh, Joanne, too, a good segue into how are the people selected? I know that you've talked about it briefly, but let's look at the rosters uh, that you have as a link, if right. that works. Um, so let's can see. Do, let me see if I can do a share screen or make sure you've got that control. I think I'm still sharing my screen. Yeah, good. So this one is... Um, <clears throat> This one is a standing committee roster index. So as I mentioned, SBIRs are typically ad hoc, but these standing committees are like for the NIH R01 basic research grant. And there's tons and tons of, of uh, study sections. All right, but in, in um, SBIR Can you go world, to that link, Joanne? Hmm? Can you go to that link? I'm on the link. Are you seeing it on my screen? No, we are not. Hmm. So you might have to select a different uh, window. Oh, I see. Let me see. Um, right. Okay, let's do it this way. You see it now? Yep. There we go. Oh, good. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. So, um, so these are our various study sections. You know, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, for example, has NIDA E F K L. All right. So, and these all stand for different things. One is a treatment research study section, one's a health services research, one's training and career development. So I want to go to the one where we can look at um, the SBIRs because these are standing. So you could see the, the rosters. Let's see, I'm just going to go into one just real quickly. You could view a, a roster. You can, you can see who the scientific review officer is. You can view the membership roster and it tells you literally the names of all these people and what year their term is up, okay? So compare that with, let's see if I can do it. Can you still see the rosters yep. now? Yep, we can. Good. So now these are SBIR, STTR study sections same thing, um, let's say it's small business drug discovery and development. So I can click there, they're hiring SROs. Dr. Sergey Rubinoff is the scientific review officer and he's showing you, here's the list of reviewers from the last review on November 15th, okay? So you can see the members, they don't have years because these are ad hoc study sections. So they don't have years of their term. But you can see how many people are on it and that most of these are from academia, but there's a few who are from small businesses. There's no requirement that um, say 15% have to be small businesses, all right? Uh, there's, they can be from industry. So Bristol Myers Squibb is on, on this one because it's drug discovery and drug development. Um, let me go back here a second. You can filter the results. I can put in medical device and it brings up a subset of, um, of study sections. And so, I don't know, we can just pick on one. BST is, uh, Actually, ETTN is an interesting one. Some of these also, some of these study sections, how can I say this? I believe some of the study sections are, are harder on you than others, but that's really difficult to assess in advance. So I don't know, let's just pick on, ETTN has two different subgroups one on clinical neurophysiology, devices and neuroprosthetics and biosensors. So you go to them. 
So can a can a, <clears throat> excuse me can a company um, re uh, get in contact with any of these reviewers at any no. point? You will be spanked and put at the back of the shed if you do that. You, you <clears throat> may even be told you're not going to be reviewed. You will never ever contact the reviewers. Um, that is in every bit of guidance. And if a reviewer is contacted, they are instructed to call the scientific review officer because you can really conflict a reviewer by doing that. Okay, so on this, on this study section, ETTN 10, it <clears throat> talks about the topics covered include new monitoring devices, analytical tools for EEG, et cetera, et cetera new applications of imaging methodologies. They give you a, an overview of the type of research that they are proposing. And then again here, you can take a look, see who's on these study sections. This is uh, Feinberg School of Medicine. This is Case Western. Here's a small company, BioCircuit. Um, that, you know, if BioCircuit if you know something about them, you're like, they are in direct conflict with us. I don't want Dr. Clements reviewing. Um, it's just too close. I mean, that's a, a call to your scientific review officer to express concern. Again, it's this balance of peers versus someone that you know has a, you know, is in um, some <coughs> sort of situation that they would maybe not score your application in a in a um, unbiased manner. They've got someone from Quebec City. So it's really broad and diverse. They look for the reviewers with expertise. They pool, they have a pool of reviewers and they'll go and select them um, from this pool based on the science that is proposed for that particular round. Hence this ad hoc um, um, nature of SBIR and STTR reviews. CEO, co-founder of Focal, Focal Cool. Okay, there is, that was another small business. Here's another small business. They're, they're balancing this issue of, oh, I know her. She's got, <laughs> they're balancing this issue of, um, kind of putting the small business representatives on because they bring a, a perspective that academics don't versus putting people on who are going to say, these guys are in conflict with me. So in a phase, we know that in a phase one, um, there is no specific commercialization plan. And in phase two, there is a requirement for the commercialization plan. Um, do they bring in phase two reviewers with expertise in commercialization uh, specifically to address the commercialization plan? How, how is that handled? Because you're, you made a good comment there that most of the reviewers are academic in nature. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, you know, how is commercialization evaluated? So a lot of times they'll look to the, um, the, the, the small business or even if it, anyone from industry to um, comment a little more heavily on the commercialization plan. It's different than NSF. I mean, they, they will assess whether or not you've addressed those specific sections of the plan. Even, even um, these scientists from academia, they can make some very useful comments in terms of uh, what your plan is for commercializing. For NIH, they more so want to know, you know, they're assessing the appropriateness of those five or so sections and, and aren't going to get into the full nitty gritty of, um, so, you know, let's see, your finance plan, they're not going to tease it apart as heavily as maybe some of the folks at NSF where they bring in people who have commercial experience. Some of these industry reviewers may not have brought something to the market yet. That said, they're from industry, they know how things should be 
taken through a regulatory process. They know how things should be commercialized, but maybe they haven't hit the market yet. But they're on here because they've been successful at getting NIH grants and they've got the expertise um, in the science area that you have proposed. Good. A um, couple of questions have come in. Joanne, when and who screens for conflicts of interest? For some, for instance, if somebody from BMY is a reviewer in a study group, I may be submitting something that competes with a reviewer's employer. So the scientific, scientific review officer screens for conflicts. They look at biosketches. They look to see where your training is or was. They look at um, publications. Um, they're doing, they're going through their checklist. In addition, on that PHS assignment request form, the applicant is able to actual, actually name names and say, this person should not be on my review committee. And that typically will benefit from a phone call to the scientific review officer to explain the why. And I'll tell you, the last thing the scientific review officer wants to do is conflict your review. So they're pretty much going to take what you say um, very, very seriously and, and avoid putting that individual on the review. That's the only time you can name names, okay? But, but now um, the reviewer can also say whether he or she is conflicted, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if the if the SRO has overlooked that or the applicant has not identified someone because they didn't go into the roster, didn't think that they could name someone, um, it is not unlikely that if there's a conflict that a reviewer would say, I shouldn't be on this, um, I should not be on the review of this. And the other thing that reviewers are told is if you if that happens, don't give it to your grad student. Like you need to bring it up to me and we will assign someone else as a reviewer. So don't give it to your postdoc or I guess that's more the. Right, right. Uh, uh, Ariel asked the question, how about contacting a reviewer who is not in my target review section to explore advising or collaboration? I mean, who's not in your target review, you don't know who's going to be in your target review section. You're looking back at prior rosters. Um, that said, if you see somebody who's, um, who's got areas of expertise that you're looking for, uh, there's nothing that says you cannot reach out and try to set up a collaboration that way or put them on as an advisor. If you do that, know that that person is not going to serve on your review. You've just conflicted them. But, but once your application is in um, and you get that 30 days in advance notification about a reviewer or about your reviewers, you cannot contact them while your application is under review. Okay, good. Um, let's see. Oh, and by the way, we were on till 1130. So um, we do have another 15 minutes if there okay. are. Let me see if there's another. Um, let me go to this one. Okay, so let me close this chat. No, I don't really want to help do that. Um, so this is the link on peer reviewer guidelines. All right, this was on slide eight. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, hold on. We can see the consolidated list of reviewer documents. Oh, you can? Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Cause I can't, okay, what I do? Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so I loved this link because um, it's got a bunch of news, 
that gets put up so that um, it's more on coronavirus, but there's, there's other newsworthy things that get placed here. Someone was just asking about conflict of interest. So here are the rules and the pre and post meeting certification changes in this, um, what does that stand for? IAR is like the, uh, um, it's the AR is for assisted review, internet assisted review. So some of the, some of the reviews are organized almost as a chat room rather than a Zoom meeting. So there's, there's various pieces to that, that, um, that this particular doc, uh, policy will address. Then there's just so much, I mean, my point for bringing this up is look at all of this information on COI. This is a huge area of interest and importance for NIH. Um, they, I think at one point there was question about, you know, does NIH have the appropriate policies in place? So they, they're like, yes, we've got policies in place. We may not have made those so publicly available. So some of these obviously go back to 2018. Then you get down to review criteria information. And there's a section on virtually everything. Guidelines for review of human subjects. Guidelines for review of inclusion of women and minorities, overall impact versus significance. We can look at that one. They're, they're brief, they're a couple, two, three pages, but they're saying to the reviewers over and to you as the applicant, overall impact is not a six review criterion. Reviewers will write a paragraph summarizing da da da. da. So, when you're just kind of hanging around at night wanting to peruse websites, I'm telling you, look through um, these guidance documents because they are, um, they're very informative. This one's on rigor and transparency. The people are like, what do you mean by scientific rigor? Okay. Concerns the quality and strength of the research being cited by the applicant as crucial to support the application. This is distinct from hypothesis or justification. The applicant should discuss the strengths and weaknesses of prior research used to support the application and how that research is going to address weaknesses or gaps. I mean, it's so uh, it's it's very plain language written, and I think can, um, can really help you guys as you're preparing your proposals. When you know you're going to be judged on scientific rigor, the other thing is they tell you, they're mapping it for you on research grants. Where is this rigor going to be looked for? Well, significance and approach section with regard to rigor of prior data and the approach section with regard to significant or for scientific rigor. Okay, so this one's a little longer, it's five pages, but um, take some time to, to really go through those. That's a vertebrate animal cheat sheet, which I didn't find was all that helpful, but um, concise description of animal procedures, justification for choice of species, interventions to minimize discomfort. Um, you know, do not request euthanasia methods, statistical and that. So if, you know, if that information is missing, then you're likely to get scored more poorly on vertebrate animals. Um, what else? You guys don't deal so much with revisions, which I said, I said is code for supplements. Um, I don't know if there's anything else on here. Oh, this might be interesting. So chair orientation. This is what the chair of the, the meeting does. Um, the chairperson of that scientific review group, read about their responsibilities. It just helps you understand what's going on, you know, to, to make that black box not such a black box, okay? 
Thank ask you, any Joanne. Reviewer scoring oh, no, outside. Joanne. Sorry, ask any reviewer scoring outside the stated range. So if you're going to be an outlier, declare their intention to do so and inform the panel of the issue that compelled their score. That's a really important point. I'm sorry, what did you say, Karen? No, I was just saying thank you. This is really, really helpful. On yeah. This. I didn't mean to over talk you. Um, it used to be when we would go to the national SBIR conferences back in the day, um, they would do a sample um, panel review, SRG study review, section. Mm -hmm. study section. Do you know if there's anything like that online? Do, have you seen any, like, does NIAID that has a lot of the grant preparation material have anything like a sample review group? There's a there's a video of a mock study section that um, that they posted, and so that's equivalent. Yeah, you could probably okay. Google NIH mock study section. Perfect. Video right. and it'll come up. Yeah, because sometimes that's people want to see how it really happens, or yeah. it used to happen before Zoom and COVID and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. So. There yeah, go. there we go. Yeah. yeah. So there's a YouTube and you can um, you can go through that. Welcome everybody to excellent study section. Yep. Excellent. Good. Good. All right. Um, any other questions for Joanne? Um, I see that we we have dwindled and I think most everyone is familiar with uh, the Maine Technology Institute and the SBIR Technical Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. um, but for those who might come back and, and listen to this later, as it will be posted on MTI's uh, fi federal financial uh, assistance page, which I'll send you the link um, once we get everything posted, um, they, they will have sorry, that page will have links, links to these videos. And um, also the PowerPoint presentations will be available on that page as well. So you'll be able to um, download the slides and peruse at your um, leisure and also be able to go to YouTube and listen to Joanne uh, directly talk about this along with the Q and A's. So all three uh, webinars in the series will be posted as well as the PowerPoints. So if there aren't any more questions, I don't see any, I think we can call it a day. Okay, well, thank you thank all very you. much. Yes, and thank you for your time and effort on this. It's very much appreciated. Okay, everyone, have a great day. Have a good week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.